Hello friends, this is just a reminder, if you don't need to hear me saying the lesson out loud to you, it's perfectly fine to skip the video and just look at the PowerPoint presentation. This is just for anybody that absorbs information better by hearing it out loud. Everything that is on this PowerPoint presentation is exactly what you would see in here in the classroom. Okay, so this is watercolor lesson four, knowing when to stop. No matter where your personal preferences take you, some level of restraint is required to keep the painting from getting overloaded. There's simply too much information to ever cram it all into one painting. We need to know when we've given the viewer just enough information and not too much. Is this enough? At some level of our thinking, we should always be asking, is this enough? A painting is a conversation. Both parties, the artist and the viewer, have roles to play. When one does all the talking, it leaves the other with nothing to do. Paintings that tell too much can be vaguely insulting. As if all that is wanted from the viewer is to be impressed and say, wow. So think about this. What do we want from our viewer? What is their role in the conversation? It's easy to get all wrapped up in the portrayal of specifics and forget to be respectful of the paint. The transparency and fluid nature of watercolor is what attracts most of us to the medium in the first place. And to me, nothing is more important than giving the watercolor room to display its tendency to flow. If we sacrifice the simple beauty of the paint for accuracy or complexity, we've made a bad bargain. The, fussy you are, the fussier you are about what happens on the paper, the more inclined you'll be to think that what you've done is not right. Correcting watercolor is a delicate art in itself. Some people become very good at it, but rather than practice how to rescue your paintings, it's better to develop the skills that will help you not make the mistakes in the first place. This means giving as much control as possible back to the paint. In this down-home subject, Maurice Logan seemed to want a casual feeling, as if the paint just slid into place by itself. With the stacked logs on the right, for example, he knew the overall shape needed to be roughly half light and half mid-value, and that the strokes needed to be horizontal. It is possible to imagine other combinations of similar strokes that would do the job equally well, but these are perfect enough. If I can establish the range of brushwork that I know will do the job, then I can make my mark with confidence and leave it alone, just as Maurice Logan has done with the stack of logs in the image here. Looking at a painting we admire, it's natural to assume that the artist meant for everything to be just as we see it. Quite often though, having made the important choices in advance, he only needed to know roughly how the paint would behave. The ideal painting is one that has nothing missing and not a single extra stroke. If the paint shows signs of having been messed with, the implication is that at some point, one of those criteria was not met. Boldly applied paint, on the other hand, convinces us that everything is as it should be. Only the artist knows if everything at the original scene really has been represented. But with watercolor, every talented viewer can detect uncertainty. The common denominators in all of the paintings I show you are the confidence with which the paint was applied and the artist's respect for the medium. Maintaining intentionality with your marks. Sometimes the sheer pleasure of making brush strokes can lead to an overloaded painting. I often see students repeating a stroke over and over as if they're biding time while they wait for inspiration. Part of what is going on is that we want to keep adding more. We came to paint after all, and it just plain feels good to swing the brush until we've noticed that we've overdone it again. Are my marks intentional? There are stages in the progress of a painting when it's fine to indulge in the sensual pleasure of moving the brush over the paper, but there comes a moment when it's wise to detach and perhaps slow down. Given the dual progression of light toward dark and general toward specific, the first layer of a painting is often composed of the big shapes, locked in with pale washes. Successive layers of middle values and darks will eventually cover much of the paint you apply at this stage, which may allow for casual brushwork. As the middle values begin to go on, however, and certainly when you get to the individual very specific dark strokes, 
a different quality of attention is called for. When the first layer of the painting above was being applied, it was not important for the artist to contain the pale washes within their respective outlines. The marks could be made casually, whence the second and third layers, shadows, shrubs, and rocks, would be dark enough to cover any overflow. If you follow the hard edge between the foreground and the background, you can see that one or the other is almost always deliberately darker. In this painting, the major shapes were blocked in with large general washes. Notice how the sharp edge between the two green bushes on the left and the darker shadows behind them does the important work of locating the shapes in space. But it was not until late in the painting process that the edge was established. Before the shadow layer was applied, the hill behind the bushes was as light as the sunlit hills on the right. Recognizing what works. The more specific the marks you're making, the more you benefit from a kind of detached engagement. While painting, make sure you pause and ask, is this okay? Think of this process as watching the painting develop stroke by stroke as if someone else were painting it. The trick is to be separated from your own intentions enough to see whether what you've just done works, regardless of whether it conforms to your original vision. It's always possible that what is happening in the moment might be just fine, even if it's not what you thought you wanted. Remembering to ask if the job is already done saves many pictures from becoming overpainted. Being deep into your own agenda, though, can blind you to what is right before your eyes. If you still decide it's not right, before you rush to correct it, ask yourself what is the minimum you could do to take it further. For example, if a hill in the distance feels too prominent, it is less invasive to change its color with a simple glaze than it would be to try to scrub it out entirely. If something about your painting bothers you, at least consider learning to love it. Doing nothing, after all, is the absolute minimum. Being suspicious of my, sorry, being suspicious of my immediate agenda and knowing that I usually lose more than I gain by going back over a spot to fix it, I'm inclined to wait and see how it looks tomorrow. Be flexible. Avoid painting yourself into a corner. The transparency of watercolor demands that we hold off on getting very specific prematurely. That's the logic behind a light to dark and general to specific progression. By not committing to brushwork that is difficult to change cleanly, we keep our range of choices as open as possible. With regards to their impact on the painting, there's a hierarchy of the marks you might make. Washes are more general than strokes. Soft edges are less specific than hard ones. Light is easier to cover than dark. And colors that are already present in the painting will be less obtrusive than new ones. And you can always add another stroke a week later if you decide it's called for, but you can't always take one away. Using the language of form. One way to keep from getting specific too quickly is to stay abstract as long as possible. This is mainly a matter of how you think about the subject. During the inner dialogue that accompanies the painting process, I can describe the image by naming everything in terms of the content, or I can stick to the language of form. Content-based narrative. This is a street scene in Mexico late in the day. One side of the street is in sunlight, the other in shadow. A woman carrying shopping bags is crossing the street, while another is standing on the sidewalk. Several cars, some parked, some moving, are in the middle distance. A big tree shows above the sunlit buildings. A mountain and the distance stands out against the clear blue sky. Here is the same scene described in the language of pure form. The right quarter and the bottom third of the page are rectangles of cool, dark, neutral. A triangle comprising warm, very light, rectilinear forms begins at the center of the page and widens towards the left. A pattern of dark verticals is distributed across the triangle. Above it, a semicircle of intense, medium, dark green is silhouetted against a middle value blue, which fills the entire top left quadrant. Where the triangle and the dark strips converge, a middle value purple gray form widens upward. Uh, what does that say? I'm so sorry. One third of the way into the blue. 
How I choose to think about the picture can have a profound effect on the way I begin to paint it. In the early stages of painting, I usually want to establish the general structure of the image without getting caught in specificity. The painting has to work first of all as an arrangement of big shapes, and at this level it's more important for the pattern of darks and lights to be strong than for any specific information about content to be present. This is why it's important to ask, how long can I stay abstract? For example, don't get involved with the proportions of the woman crossing the street and lose track of the fact that she's primarily part of a big shadow. If you were actually standing in the scene, you would be aware of the figures, but you would probably not be studying them in any detail. In the painting, you want the elements of the picture to have an emotional presence similar to the actual experience, which is not necessarily the same thing as seeing them in a photograph. Photos exert a powerful influence. It's easy to assume that the painting will feel right only if I duplicate the photo exactly, especially if I'm already thinking of the elements of the picture as people, buildings, cars, and trees. When I'm thinking in terms of big abstract shapes, however, there are no people, no sidewalks, no shopping bags, just a few somewhat darker and lighter strokes within the big shadow. This leaves me free to decide what role I want each part to play. The above painting, sorry, not above, it's next to it, <laughs> of the scene done from this point of view. Um, the individual components, people, buildings, cars, and trees are minimally described and out of context, might be difficult to recognize, but all together add up to a realistic interpretation. A content-based approach would have invited all the associations that attend the names of every part of the scene. Like many realist artists, I'm susceptible to an imperative to do justice to each subject. They could easily um, have gotten wrapped up in an accurately rendering postures, hairstyles, body parts, and on and on until the figures had taken on too much importance in the scene. Um, the figures in the foreground have a presence, sorry, have a presence appropriate to the role they play in the big picture. Thinking abstractly allowed me to stop as soon as I saw that they'd done their job. The vegetation in this photograph can be described as uh, either as a big tree that shows above the sunlit buildings or as a semicircle of intense medium green silhouetted against a middle value blue, depending upon whether the language of, is of content or of language. So for your assignment, um, Oh, the assignment was to paint the classroom. I want you to paint the room that you're in, okay? Break the painting down into simple shapes and washes. Start light, build with shadow. Don't focus on the details, do just enough, okay? Capture the essence of the room over the specifics. So your goal here is to not focus on the little details, not to focus on the specifics, okay? You're just giving me an overall feel of the room, the essence of the room. I wanna see the big shapes, the big colors, um, the different values. Got it? Cool. All right, let me know if you need any help.